Hi, I'm Michelle Weems and I'd like to welcome you to the latest business seminars organised by the University of the Highlands and Islands with Business Gateway and the Enterprise Europe Network. The University's Gary I. Campbell interviews a special guest each week which was recorded in front of a live audience. In the first seminar of this series, Gary interviews Susan Hoyle, a taxation specialist with Wright, Johnston and McKenzie on how to sack your father and other pressing issues in family business. Before we go to the interview, let's talk to Gary about this seminar's topic. Gary, so why is succession planning so important? Well, Michelle, this is really important for family businesses. What happens when the founder, dad or granddad, wants to take a back seat or wants to retire? How does he ensure that he moves the business forward to the next generation? Is it the management team? Is it the kids? Is it the grandchildren who will take over from him? He's got to look at this very carefully to ensure that the business has not suffered any interruption and the successful thing that he's set up actually carries on into the future. However, the other side of it is true. Maybe sometimes the kids or the grandchildren think they can run it better than granddad and they actually want rid of him and he won't leave. So hence the reason, how do you sack your father? It's a bit of a strange question, but it can actually be very, very serious for family businesses. However, some of the most successful family businesses in Scotland are four or five generations. So with a little bit of planning and the right advice, you can continue to have a really successful family business right the way through all these generations. And that's what we'll talk to Susan about today. Thanks very much, Gary. We're now going over to the Executive Office of the University of the Highlands and Islands for the interview. Just to get us going, um, so that we understand a little bit about the context of the day. Mm -hmm. from, your, from your own perspective, what's a bit of background to Wright Johnson Mackenzie, who you work for, and also why you set up Family okay. Business Solutions? Okay, well, Wright Johnson Mackenzie is a legal practice offering the usual legal services. And in about the mid 1990s, they started to really focus on family businesses. They sponsored the Centre for Family Enterprise at Caledonia University in Glasgow, which offered education programmes to business families and a sort of networking forum. And one of the things about family businesses is they are different from other types of business because you have the business dimension and you have the family dimension and they overlap and often collide because of the different interests. And one of the things that I think is very, or we think is very important is to actually effectively advise family businesses, you have to be talking to the whole family because even if they're not working in the business, they have a significant stake and interest in the business. Yep. So, so, well, with that in mind, what, what is a family business? How do you define it? Uh, I suppose the, the technical definition is it's a, it's a business that is majority controlled and owned by a single family. Okay. Um, and how do they start? Um, well, often, well, for any number of reasons, we're working with a family at the moment where the father took redundancy from rent -a kill and used his redundancy money to set up a similar business, but in a very, sort of in Scotland, in a narrow kind of geographical location. And the reason that we're working with that family at the moment is that he is sort of retired and his two sons are now working in the business. So it's moving from what we would call a controlling owner who owned it, ran it and made all the decisions, nice and simple. But with the two sons coming into the business, both in you know, management positions, mm -hmm. so the questions have arisen about really between the two of them, who decides what? And we also have had to have a discussion about who will ultimately own the business. So with that in mind, how, how long have these guys been working together? I mean, has this been quite a quick process with them or, or is this something that, that takes a while for dad to start the business and then you know, the rest of the family to come in? Dad is nearly 70 and had been, so he started the business in his 50s. All right. And the two boys are in their probably mid 30s and have been in the business for maybe 15 years. They'd gone in more or less from school and or college. Okay, so, the, so we've got a position here that we'll, we'll explore this one a wee bit further. So Dad started it, he's taken his redundancy money, which I think is probably quite a common way of, of starting mm -hmm. businesses, I think, and, and certainly around the, the, the highlands and islands area, um, people find themselves in a position and they, they start up. The, the kids come in. So with, with this example, then 
what is what has prompted them to have this discussion with yourselves? I mean, you're talking about this. Uh, I think you call it a sibling partnership. Mm -hmm. This is the next level. The next level. And so, what's prompted them to to do this? And and how's Dad taken it? Well, it was the older son who actually got in touch with us. And this is you're often look, there will often be a trigger for them looking for help, and it's usually caused by some anxiety over the future. And he's obviously invested a lot of his time and effort in running the business and trying to grow the business. And he's in his mid thirties and thinking, am I going to continue doing this? And if I am going to continue doing this, I want to know what the future for is going to look like for me. So when is my dad? He says he's retired. He doesn't come in five days a week, um, but he still owns the business and he still pops in a lot. So before we come on to how we deal with dad keeping popping in, which is clearly, mm -hmm. the, I think, the, is, is the, the nub of this discussion <laughs> when we get to this about how do, we, how do we shuffle dad out through the door, what about the dynamic with the, the two brothers? What, what happens there? I mean, you said one of them contacted you. Did he tell his brother? Or? Um, I don't think he told his brother before he contacted us, but when we met, the mum and the dad and the brother were there. And probably one of the underlying reasons for the older brother contacting us was he felt that he was doing more and contributing more in terms of running the business and growing the business but in this family kind of with a slight family first mentality both brothers were getting paid the same ah, and uh -huh. there was an expectation that the business would eventually be owned 50 50 but there was obviously an underlying tension with the older one thinking, I'm doing more, he's not performing as well as he should be, and therefore I should be getting paid more, uh -huh. and possibly I should be the one that has the majority. That's in charge. That be in charge, basically. So the issue there was like, who's in charge between and the brothers? And with that, were there any other siblings? They, they had um, two daughters as well, okay. who didn't work in the business and had no interest in working in the business and that then led to a discussion well if you're leaving the business to the two boys what are the girls going to get because a big issue for parents is how do I be fair mm -hmm. to all my children which doesn't mean treating them all equally but the family has to work out what it feels is fair and then obviously if you make decisions in relation to the business you have to think about the impact of those decisions on other family members. This sounds like some sort of counselling service. <laughs> <laughs> no, <Nope. laughs> we don't offer counselling, <laughs> no. <Nope>. Okay. <laughs> Very practical. <laughs> and um, so, so taking it the next, I mean, we'll go on about what happens once dad's gone, but the nub of it is, I mean, let's say you're in a position, how does one sack one's father? Or another family member, I suppose it, I, mm -hmm. I suppose it does happen that it's maybe not dad, it might be your brother, it might mm -hmm. be your mum, or, or mm -hmm. how do you do that? With great difficulty, um, <laughs> because often the father is the one with the power, he may well still own the majority of the business, he'll still be on the board. If you try and sack him, you can end up being sacked yourself. So it's, ex it's extremely difficult and one of the one of the, the things that really families need to be educated in these these transitions are entirely predictable mm -hmm. and if you can get them to start thinking about a succession plan early in the same way that they will sit down and think about a strategy for the business they should really have a strategy in place for this transition and one of the sort of key questions is to the senior generation when are you going to retire Mm -hmm. and trying to get them to make some form of commitment to mm -hmm. the date and then you start to sort of transition slowly to the next generation so that you don't reach the point where you have to walk in and say to your father could you please just stop coming to work because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> you're undermining us <laughs> and the employees are confused because okay you say you know Oh, I'm just charging. Uh, I'm just in charge of stock. Well, actually, all of the employees look to you yes. for decisions, so it completely undermines the next generation. So, have you developed a process for this, for yes. sitting down and chatting with people? Yes, yes. and and one, that's one of the reasons really we set up Family Business Solutions was to offer a consulting service. We don't provide legal advice, 
because the, the problem for many lawyers is that to advise the whole family they feel constrained because they get into conflict of interest situations mm -hmm. so they end up aligning themselves with dad or mum or the next generation and it just doesn't work mm -hmm. to actually facilitate a conversation between the generations so as consultants we can go in facilitate that discussion between the generations as an independent neutral advisor and once the family have worked out where they're going and what they want to do at that point lawyers their other advisors their lawyers their accountants come in and actually implement what, what's, what, been what's been decided mm -hmm. so that was really one of the reasons we set up a, a separate business to work with family businesses Sounds like brokering. It is facilitating <laughs> brokering <laughs> and, and trying to help the family work out for themselves what they want because while the issues are generally the same, the solutions will depend very much on how that individual family feels about things. <laughs> yes, I suppose it. Yeah, because they're all like you know they're all unique and but the issues that they face <laughs> are the same. Not the same. The Moving on, let's say you know, that Dad's agreed to go mm -hmm. um, and you've got, I mean, again, I suppose the situation that we've already talked about would be a, an appropriate one. We've got the two brothers working in the business and we've got mm -hmm. two, two other daughters who aren't working in the, the business, but Dad's built it up, it's his business, it's his legacy, mm -hmm. so to speak, and he decides, for example, to hand it over or hand over some of the ownership mm -hmm. to the people that aren't working in the business. Mm -hmm. w what happens then? Because I'd imagine that causes a bit of tension as well. Um, in some families it can because some families are wired to think that um, you get the shares in the business for the sweat of your brow so if you're not working in the business you're not entitled to own it. I think that's changing slightly and because more you know in the past a parent would have happily just handed it on to the eldest son and that's it daughters go and get married and sort yourselves out. That's becoming less common and it's more common now for a parent to think, well, I want to be fair, I'm going to give the shares, spread them amongst the children. Some are working and some aren't working. And in that situation, it's even more important that they get themselves organised mm -hmm. because you can have quite a lot of resentment between the siblings who are working in the business, working extremely mm -hmm. hard, and then they've got siblings sitting outside the business who've just inherited the shares, they haven't paid for them, and they're getting a very nice dividend. So how do, how do you manage that going forward? I mean, because uh, I could imagine that if you come down and see another generation or another generation, then you've got, you've got a scattering of people yeah. that, that might own yeah. little bits of a business that they've never actually had anything to do with. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the, going back to the, you know, you've got working and non-working owners, what is very important there, or sort of two key things really is, who decides what in terms of decisions about the business because by and large it would be the board the working owners who would really have all the power and be able to make all the decisions in relation to the business and their siblings might trust them and think that's absolutely fine they might not trust them in which case they might think well I'm an owner and I want to make I want to be involved in decisions about borrowing money or making you know taking on debt or granting security so there'll be a discussion around about where the power lies between the working owners and the non-working owners and the other really important um, thing that needs to be considered there is a dividend policy and remuneration so that you strike the balance between um, remunerating those who are working in the business and the interests of the non-working owners in terms of I want a return on my capital and the working owners are saying well we want the money in the business to reinvest. I suppose it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic because it is a bit like giving somebody some shares in any business yes. but then you've got the family overlay yes. that you've described yes. yeah, that, that has to be managed. Yes. Some, some people talk about family boards and things like that, do they come about? And they can come about and, and in the situation where you have working and non-working owners you might find um, that the non-working owners will have the ability to appoint, for example, a non-executive to the board who will look after their interests okay. effectively at a board level. 
And is there anything, I mean, is there any sort of kind of bizarre situation that you've come across when someone's decided to, for example, sack their, their father? father. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, some of the people in the room may already have heard Martin Stepick speak. He's oh, yeah. the chairman of the Scottish Family Business Association, but his family did own the Stepick electrical mm -hmm. business. His dad, Polish immigrant, had come to Scotland. He's got you know, no other means of earning money starts fiddling about with transistor radios and fixing them, builds up a very big profitable business. Martin's dad and his wife have 10 children. Oh, right. Martin, three of his brothers end up working in the business. Dad retires in inverted commas, but has an office in the, in oh. the headquarters, <laughs> turns up every day. At this point, Martin, I think, is managing director and his brother's the sales director and starting to get extremely frustrated with dad popping in every day, getting himself in the office. The secretaries run about looking after him, getting his tea and his cake. And, <laughs> and he wanders about saying, well, I wouldn't have done that. Well, what are you doing that for? So eventually, Martin and his brother together, because neither of them would do it on their own, had to walk into their dad's office and say, you really have to stop coming to work because, and his father took it very, very gracefully. Good. But 48 hours later, he had to, he and his brother had to go for Sunday lunch as the family had done every week for the rest of the family. years and years with the rest <laughs> of the family to be met by his mother, who was extremely annoyed. All right. <laughs> really annoyed. <laughs> We, we see the dynamic here, yes. yes. <laughs> and worse than that, a few years later, he then had to sack his youngest brother, uh -huh. which went down like a lead balloon with his mum. Oh, How right. could you sack my baby? Okay. Well, I think <laughs> that's a, a very um, prescient point to leave it on. That, that <laughs> not only have we sacked a father, but we've sacked a, a younger brother, brother as well. <laughs> and, uh, and, and at the same time, I, I think we, we take the message there that you must look to see where the real power yes. lies in a family before you make some decisions. Yes, it's yes, not always yes. visible. It may well be sitting back at home, <laughs> yes, giving, get, get, giving the, the actual directions to everybody else. Yes, yeah. yeah. Susan, thank you very You're much. Very that was absolutely brilliant. Eh? <laughs> that was an interview with Susan Hoyle of Wright, Johnston and Mackenzie speaking to Gary I. Campbell of the University of the Highlands and Islands. This programme was produced by Inverness TV in association with Business Gateway and the Enterprise Europe Network. I'm Michelle Weems and I hope you can join us for another in the series.